biblical perspectives on the news is produced by the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, which is solely responsible for its content. The views and opinions expressed on this program do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of KCRG TV9. Good morning. Welcome to this week's edition of Ethical Perspectives on the News. My name is Craig Van Sant. I teach at the University of Northern Iowa and hold the David W. Wilson Chair in Business Ethics there. Several of our recent shows have focused on the just completed political campaigns and the elections. Uh, many citizens are still trying to figure out what the results mean for the United States and for the world. Many more are still trying to figure out why the results are as they are. But today, I want to turn our attention away from the elections, the candidates, the campaigns, and focus on us as citizens of the United States. Our founding fathers recognized the need for a well-educated populace. But I want to take that and see what that means for us today. Um, we're privileged to have with us today Leslie Jones, an eighth grade social studies teacher at Benjamin Franklin School here in Cedar Rapids. Leslie, thank you for appearing with us. Yes, thank you. We also are lucky to have Derek Buckaloo, a, his, a professor of history at Coe College. Derek, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Great to be with you, Craig. Good. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to hear the political theorist Benjamin Barber speak at a university. His primary message, as I remember it, is that American colleges and universities do a really good job of educating consumers, but a terrible job of educating citizens. As a business professor, I guess I should be happy that we are doing a good job of educating consumers. But I think, I think on a bigger scale, the message is that we're not doing well at producing good citizens. And this is a personal concern that I have that we have either forgotten or lost interest in being citizens. And so with that cheery note, <laughs> Derek, I'd like to start with you and ask why, what was it that our founding fathers knew that caused them to want an educated populace? Well, they, they certainly were firm believers in the value of education, and in particular public education. And given the experiment that they launched uh, with sort of self-governance or governance by the people in uh, the late 18th century, um, they firmly believed that it was important that uh, the American people be educated. And of course, Americans at that time had a very high literacy rate to begin with. But it was particularly important to the founders, and Jefferson and uh, John Adams and Benjamin Franklin all spoke in this vein uh, for a number of reasons. One was that they felt that democracy could only function with a uh, population that uh, you know, could take in information, uh, could think it through, could see the uh, different sides of policy choices. And for them, crucially, it wasn't just out of self-interest, the individual voters saying, what would be best for me? but um, that an educated population would have the wisdom to see what would be best for the society as a whole. And so they believed that democracy could only flourish if there was a uh, population that was, uh, that was very well educated. It was also important to them that that uh, education be broadly shared by the population. Uh, Thomas Jefferson in particular um, believed that it was crucial that uh, an aristocracy of virtue and talent be built in the United States. He believed that um, skills and, uh, and abilities had uh, been spread throughout the population. Rich folk and poor folk had uh, value that they could bring uh, to uh, the society, but that it had to be brought out and it had to be developed through education. And so he felt that, uh, that uh, a meritocracy could be built from broad public education. And the last thing I would say is that 
they believe firmly that this should be public education, that um, the investment the society would make in its people would pay off in spades, and that uh, it was well worth whatever those costs might be. And it reminds me, of course, of the bumper sticker, uh, if you think education is expensive, you should try ignorance. Uh, the Founding Fathers didn't have bumpers to put stickers on, but they firmly would have believed in that sentiment. Sure. Now, you, as you talk about education, it sounds like you're talking about the broad spectrum, reading, writing, arithmetic, um, they were not focused just on educating to become good voters or good citizens. No, they were children of the Enlightenment, uh, and Enlightenment ideals um, led them to believe that, that humans had remarkable capacities to gather information and to develop knowledge, that they could observe them, the world around them, the natural world, they could observe uh, fellow human beings and, and learn from those experiences. And so uh, for them, this, this had uh, a lot to do with all kinds of things, foreign languages, literature, uh, natural sciences, uh, you know, theories of law and, and politics and that kind of thing. And so it was certainly broadly construed. Um, and of course, part of uh, the reality today is that there, there are various debates about exactly what should be taught and how it should be taught in our schools, including with regard to civic education. And we can, we can talk about some of those um, political or partisan debates about exactly how this should be done. Um, but it really was wide-ranging you know, observation and development of knowledge, and they, and they believe that all of that could lead to not just being a good citizen, but, but having a full life where one used you know, all the faculties one had uh, on hand to, uh, to uh, you know, live the good life in certain ways. Sure. I was going to say, can you think of safeguards that the Founding Fathers put in place because they didn't trust that the common people would be smart enough to, to vote and to make wise decisions? I mean, that has come up a lot in my class. Of course. Um, you know, the, the thing that should be pointed out here is when they talk in principle, about uh, wide access and that sort of thing. They're, they're thinking about white men at this stage. Uh, and so there were, uh, you know, even when they talked about all men being created equal, uh, they had in mind particular people. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that system has been flexible enough that, you know, over time it's expanded to, in, in, you know, encompass lots of different um, people. But in terms of the political system, I mean, the obvious example is the Electoral mm -hmm. College, that it, it is sure. not, quote unquote, a pure democracy. We're not raising our hands and choosing uh, a president. We're going to put a system in place where uh, kind of a wise group of electors in the end get selected in each state and uh, get, to, uh, get to choose the president. Uh, in addition, of course, senators were not uh, you know, voted by popular vote at that point. That was a, uh, a progressive era uh, uh, amendment to the Constitution that made uh, you know, U.S. senators uh, voted by, directly by the people. Uh, lots of them were selected by state legislatures or other sorts of means based on, uh, uh, you know, on a state-by-state -state basis. So there are a variety of ways that they hedged against um, what I'll kind of call the rabble. Uh, they were suspicious of that and wanted to make sure that uh, sure. that wouldn't, uh, wouldn't go too far. Um, and these are things that, of course, get negotiated over time in the American system, and, and we have a, a much broader sense of that now. Um, sure. So. Well, Leslie, you're on the front lines yes. of educating today. Um, tell us what the requirements are in terms of civic education in the state of Iowa, and how are we doing at that? Well, we're, f we're looking at a change. We're looking to, to adopt some standards that would make civic education be a requirement K through 12. And that's something that I think is supported by a lot of social studies teachers. Right now, um, most eighth graders in a Cedar Rapids district take social studies and civics is eighth grade social studies. Although all of the students who are high level math and science and um, foreign language, they have an option to take classes at the high school level at Washington or Kennedy. And opt out of and the opt, civics And course. opt out of, oh. of civics. So typically I have all, of, all eighth graders except for those high level PAC students, um, including behavioral disability, the autism program, um, the intellectual disability, some of those students, um, students who are special ed, in mm -hmm. addition to the general education students. Which has to make your job 
extremely difficult. Um, I, I think Derek and I are on the luxury end of the <laughs> education scale. Yes, uh, difficult and interesting, never a dull moment. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. So sure. I have students who have a reading level of maybe second or fourth grade and students who are very fluent readers. And, and even some of my students who might not be strong academically in, in L.A. classes, if they've had enough real world experience, they can be my social studies superstars. Yeah. And they can bring in those discussions that they've had at home or in the neighborhood and, and really apply it to the topics that, that are every day in the classroom. Sure. And are there, the way the Iowa standards are today, will students see this material again before they graduate from high school? Or uh, is this their one shot at it? Well I, well, I think we need to be honest that not all of our students graduate from high school. And the students that I feel like I'm most concerned about getting citizenship education are dropout concerns even at eighth grade or their attendance concerns if they've missed, you know, 60 days of school, sixth, seventh, mm -hmm. and eighth grade. Um, so there are students that we want to reach because we know that they might not graduate, but, but most high school students will take it as a junior or senior in some sort of government class. Okay. Derek, I want to come back to something you said about Thomas Jefferson's ideas. Mm -hmm. And if I remember the way you said it, was that Jefferson thought we could develop an aristocracy of skills and talents, something like that? Yes. The aristocracy. Virtue and talents, I believe. Yes. Virtues and talents. Yes. The aristocracy is the word that I'd like you to expand on mm -hmm. because that goes, seems to go against everything that we think American values are. Well, I, this is a bit uh, speculative, but I would say he, it was a play on words for, for Jefferson. Uh, in other words, it was a way of um, critiquing the standard understanding of aristocracy when he said okay. that. In other words, it was sort of, um, you know, I don't know that he necessarily meant uh, aristocracy in the sense of an exclusive class that, uh, that would be self-perpetuating, um, because the very idea of talent or merit um, suggested a, you know, a move in and a move out over time. And, uh, and the, even that phrasing uh, is in the, the context of quotes where he talks about um, the idea that uh, the creator had spread talents among all people, uh, rich and poor, and that it would be to the benefit of the society to um, find those talented folk and to give them the ability to develop those skills. So when, I, when he used aristocracy, I think it was, it was by design to sort of suggest what he was challenging, which was the aristocracy Thank you. of wealth. That, that makes yeah. a great deal of sense. Um, let me ask another question. We've talked about the Founding Fathers wanting a well-educated population because democracy depended on that. My guess is that the general level of education among the American citizenry today is significantly higher than it was in the late 1700s. And yet there's tremendous concern about the lack of our citizens voting intelligently. Um, how, do we, how do we explain that juxtaposition? that the education levels have risen, and have risen, and yet the way we vote may not be very good. I would speak to that. I, I guess I, I talk with students who do not see themselves represented in our government, and I think that when we are looking to include a larger group of people, we'll see them represented in our government. And I think that some people, some of my students who say that their families are not voting are because they think their vote doesn't matter or um, you know they're choosing the lesser of two evils have, has come up a lot in the sure. classroom this year um, but I think that there are some people who don't feel included in our democracy and that therefore they choose not to to, to participate in the democracy for that reason okay so I'm going to ask you some more thoughts about that you know I'd say there's some other elements here and, and a lot of them don't really have to do with um, the education system in the United States. Um, some of this has to do with the role of money in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. and the very real sense that um, policy does not follow from uh, what a majority of Americans might prefer. 
um, but follows the lobbying money and uh, follows the wishes of um, wealthier Americans. And there's some, some very convincing political science studies that suggest that the, the correlations are very clear uh, on this issue. Um, which would lead to the idea that votes don't matter, uh, because once you get to uh, D.C., uh, you know that uh, that swamp that needs to be drained is full of alligators with uh, full pockets. Uh, that alligator that really, purses. As that it really, were. yes, exactly. That really uh, make make for a difficult situation with regard to that. Um, I would also say, you know. Um, that some of it is about um, the realities of kind of media and technology. I mean, the 24-hour news cycle, uh, I would argue, has not been good for the nature of discourse uh, in American life. Um, I think that, uh, and this is also very clear, that once the Cold War ended, the amount of international news being covered by American media, both on television and in print, uh, and now it would be on the web, has been drastically reduced. And in as much as that has allowed us to kind of turn inward to, to ourselves more, um, I think that, that hurts us. Um, some of the experience that I think leads to um, thinking more generously and more broadly about issues and about votes is not necessarily educational experience, but travel experience or meeting people who are different than who you are, and certainly in this last election, uh, you know the you know where the votes were for Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton sh uh, certainly showed an, an urban-rural divide um, that gets at um, culture and life experience and and all kinds of things. Um, none of that necessarily has anything to do with exactly what's happening in uh, the school down the street from uh, from where we sit. So you're absolutely right that the, the, le the overall level of education is, is much higher than it was 200 years ago. Um, whether it's exactly where it was 50 years ago could be debated, but again, I think the education system is being asked to carry a lot of water for the society as a whole, often with diminishing support from the state and from, uh, from funding sources. And that's where this idea of public education becomes so important, mm -hmm. because the Founding Fathers were very clear that this was an investment in the future of, of the society. And it was absolutely key that it be broadly shared and broadly paid for. And um, in all kinds of ways, we are less comfortable in one way or another with that. And what we're ending up with is an, is an actual aristocracy where wealthy students sprint ahead largely because mm -hmm. of all of the uh, intensive investment in their experiences that their families can afford and have the time to give them, while um, middle class families and poorer families are unable, even as they do more for their children, unable to keep up. And what that's creating is a bifurcation in education outcomes. And, and Leslie well knows that the key correlate of you know, SAT test scores and all kinds of things is actually family wealth. Family. It has very little to do with uh, you know, whether you, you know, you're, you're a sharp kid or you know, even necessarily the schools you're in. It has to do with uh, the wealth of the family you're raised in. Mm -hmm. so. I think we're looking to see that, um, that the students know the content but can apply the content. And I think sometimes because of testing and funding issues, I have students coming into an eighth grade classroom that don't know the basics, so we have to work on the basics in order to apply the content. Um, but getting them to respect diverse opinions and have um, informed voices in their democracy, even if it doesn't mean voting at their, at their age, uh, I think is a, is a really important idea. So. Um, not just in social studies, but in any classroom at Franklin Middle School, we're teaching students to be considerate and to think of themselves as part of a, a community and, and not be selfish. And again, in all kinds of ways, the, the culture's moved against mm -hmm. uh, you know, thoughtful discourse or listening. Uh, right. you know, for 20 years, uh, you know, the model on cable news has been a shouting model, yes. not, sure. a, uh, not a reasoned approach model. Right. And uh, in, of, in as much as that has more to do with feeling than, you know, careful argumentation or thinking, um, I think it, it, uh, it, we do it at our peril, kind of, right. uh, you know, having feeling overwhelm. You've got to have feeling. I mean, that tells you what's important and what you want to do, but you've got to couple that with thoughtfulness, I think, to end up with good policy. A lot of my students want to have hot, intense debates that can lead to fights in the hallway, and I'm avoiding that at all costs because I feel like they are getting that in the news um, of people are either or, it's black or white, it's bad and 
you know, good, good, and it needs to be, it's complicated or it depends and, and to see some more of the gray areas and a lot of times, you know, they might be parroting what they hear at home or rebelling against what they hear at home, but having, sure. having some informed ideas based on multiple sources and, and citing evidence is more important. And even comfort with nuance often comes right. with more education rather than less. It sure. comes with having to grapple with some things that are not pat and not uh, necessarily simple questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's a comfort level that comes with that too uh, as that gets developed. And you mentioned too that um, we're worse off than we were in the past. And I would disagree with that, and I feel like it's time for me to retire if I ever believe that. I feel like we are moving forward in so many ways, and it's anecdotal, but I've had more students be um, openly gay or um, openly identifying with different ethnic groups than I feel like they would have in the past. Certainly. And I know that's anecdotal, but I would say in the last 12 years of teaching, I haven't seen that except for in the past couple of years. We even had a student um, who was being bullied about, you know, kids were joking about how he was going to get deported. And that was addressed quickly and, and nipped in the bud mm -hmm. at our school. And I feel like different students feel like the adults in our building are, are there to protect them. And if I feel like I'm getting to be the, to the point as a teacher where I think that our society is going to hell in a handbasket, then maybe it's time for me to look for other work. <laughs> well, I, I'm glad to hear you say that. Um, what I meant when I said we're, didn't actually use the word going hell in a hand basket, <laughs> but when I mentioned that we're not voting as intelligently, mm -hmm. I was wanting to pinpoint that area. I do think we've made great social strides um, in many areas. Uh, but let me kind of put the ball in your court again, Leslie. Derek gave us a whole laundry list of things that are working against reasoned thought and reasoned discourse in Including our society. Hormones? That ends up that ends up mattering, you know, in the public square or right. mattering in Washington DC. Right. Is that and he it? didn't mention teenage hormones. <laughs> well that's, no, that's your challenge. That's right? that's a given. Um, is it properly up to education to combat all of those issues? When I thought about this question, I reversed it. I said, what if we did not take that responsibility as public educators? If we did not say we want our students to be kind and to be considerate and to be educated and to be well-rounded and to participate in their community and to be um, part of our democratic society. I think that if we were to to look at it in the opposite way, if we if we did not do those things, mm -hmm. it would be a scary world. I think that we look for a society where we're, you know, I'm, I'm raising little ones and they'll go to public school here in, in the district and I, I want peace and prosperity for my family but also for my neighborhood and my state, my country, the world. So I think when we think about the what we're risking if we don't educate our students, it's it's scary to think about that. Sure. Well, and even, you know, the effect, not to turn this into a back in my day you know, rant, <laughs> but, you know, even the effect of technology and, and the internet, you know, which, which I love. I have a smartphone and I'll mm -hmm. check Twitter after we're done taping this and all kinds of things. Um, but, but getting blasts of prose, right? Even 140 character blasts in the case of mm -hmm. Twitter. Um, you know, what are the implications of growing up with that from age 12 on? you know, in terms of being patient with reading or um, realizing that, you know, f finding out what you think of an issue might take you uh, uh, days or hours, uh, not just a few minutes. Sure. Um, and even the, the conflation of research with Googling. Uh, you know, I, I will Google tonight, I'm sure, too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it, but yeah. it's not the same thing as, you know, patiently tracking down books and, and finding out what you want to do. Thinking of the college level and the work we do at college. And I feel the same way with regard to, you know, to reading assignments at, at Co. Um, you know, in some ways I feel it's all the more important to assign reading and, and you know, require students to sort of grapple with uh, arguments sure. that, that unfold over 
15 pages or 50 pages or 200 pages rather than just small numbers because if not with me, where will they get it uh, given kind of the state of the culture? Sure. So. Our staff development recently was about student engagement and we were reading an article and all the sources were 10 years or older and I think that we need to teach the students we have, mm -hmm. so to speak, and they're in mm -hmm. a world where their attention is split with multiple screens and multiple ideas with sh very short attention spans and I think it's it's going to be a steep learning curve for educators. Well, we've talked a lot about what the issues are in terms of education and citizenship and we're coming close to the end of today's show. Let's look at solutions. What do we do to have a better informed electorate to have more engaged citizens? I don't want to get rid of the STEM focus, but I think there's such a focus on science, technology, engineering, and math that you know certain subjects get kind of downplayed, like social studies mm -hmm. or civics education when we're testing and funding certain programs and not others. Or humanities and literature, which develops mm -hmm. empathy, right? It's an easy sure. way to, to, to see other people's lives and connect with them. Um, I, think, I think it's a tough question because I think it's a political question. Uh, it has to do with, um, you know, being willing to commit to education as uh, the, the best way forward for our children and, and, a, and a necessary good in developing, uh, developing the culture. And uh, of course, there are state governments and other governments that uh, you know, have mixed feelings about their public education systems and uh, mixed feelings about the costs of, of, um, of paying for it. And of course, uh, talk politically about you know, uh, all kinds of these costs. And I think that really makes it, makes it difficult. I think it's a really big question for the culture and you know you you talked about uh, people being able to recognize their interests and vote their you know vote their interests. Um, we don't need to get into that you know thicket, right. but uh, that's a whole question in terms of who do we have in mind in terms of not understanding their own interests and uh, mm -hmm. that might uh, you know get us to a whole analysis of, of things. Uh, I do think a, rec a recognition of what those what one's interests might be changes when you have more experience and more education. Um, but I think there are, frankly, some politicians that would see that as the threat, not right. the solution. Well, it, it has always interested me that when we talk about competing globally, I'm a business professor, mm -hmm. we talk about the need for education. We need students with higher skill levels. And then they turn around the next day and cut funding mm -hmm. for education. Mm -hmm. That just doesn't make any sense. Um, I, we're, kind of, we're almost out of time. Um, any last thoughts that you would like to leave our audience with? Well, I think both of us are firm believers in the power of education mm -hmm. and, the, and that everybody, however humble their beginnings are, uh, can learn more, can expand their experience in their minds, and uh, I'd recommend that to everybody. I always cool. use the analogy of planting a seed. In my classroom, I'm not going to see how the seed develops, but maybe the idea gets planted. Great. On behalf of the Interreligious Council of Lynn County, I'd like to thank you very much for watching this show. Thank both of you for appearing on it. Have a good week. Good job.